Welcome everyone to Empowering Global Ambassadors for Animals, one LLM at a time. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Tara Cooley. I earned my LLM at, in animal law at Lewis and Clark, and I am the animal law teaching fellow at University of Connecticut School of Law. Now I would like to introduce our speakers who all received their LLM in animal law from Lewis and Clark Law School. Bianca Atlas is a lawyer from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Bianca has researched, published, and presented on a range of animal law issues, including aquatic animal protection, international wildlife law, plant-based meat labeling, and the link between domestic violence and animal abuse. Jim Kareni is a director at Lawyers for Animal Protection in Africa, LAPA, a nonprofit engaging in research and advocacy in animal law issues in Africa. Before joining LAPA, he headed the legal legal team at Wild Direct Kenya, engaging in the Hands Off Our Elephants campaign, leading environmental public interest litigation, and following up on a major ivory trafficking court case in Kenya. Jim is currently pursuing a PhD in criminal justice at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Hira Jalil is a legal practitioner from Pakistan who is currently working as a senior associate at Access Law Chambers a full service corporate and commercial law firm in Lahore, Pakistan. As part of her practice, she regularly advises clients on animal related legal issues, such as advising on the legal rights of clients threatened with eviction and seizure of their companion animals by housing authorities, assisting with prosecution of animal abuse cases and supporting animal welfare nonprofits with registration and regulatory compliance. Diego Plaza is a Chilean lawyer, founder, and executive director of the Center for Animal Law Studies, CETA Chile, and founder and president of the Interspecies Justice Foundation. He is also a researcher at CETA Chile and co-researcher of the Handbook on Global Animal Law. Thank you for, to all of you for joining us today. We will begin with Bianca's presentation. Good morning, Atamare from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank you to the Animal Legal Defence Fund and the Centre for Animal Law Studies for the opportunity to speak at this conference. It's truly an honour to be able to participate in such a wonderful event from the South Pacific. I would like to start by acknowledging the Indigenous leaders, past, present and future, Māori and Aotearoa and others around the world who play an instrumental role as kaitiaki or guardians of our natural world. We have a lot to learn from Indigenous worldviews about the interrelatedness of all life knowledge that will help transform our relationship with animals and support us all to better protect them. With that, I would like to touch on a couple of recent developments affecting animals in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and areas where I see opportunities for further work by lawyers with expertise in animal law. So the first of these is litigation on the use of pig farrowing crates, and the second is the live export campaign. Firstly, a recent decision by the High Court of New Zealand regarding the use of pig farrowing crates. I'd just like to provide a very brief background about pig farming in New Zealand. So we have about 100 commercial pig farms um, with around 800,000 pigs raised and killed every year. And around 60% of these are farmed indoors. Farrowing crates are small barred metal cages, which involves severe physical and behavioral restrictions for pigs. Uh, the cages are only slightly larger than the mother pig's body, allowing her just enough room to stand and lie down, but preventing her from turning around. There's no bedding or stimulation provided, so pigs are unable to express their natural behaviour, such as nest building. This leads to boredom and distress, and this is manifested in tail biting and other aggressive behaviours. And in turn, these issues are then addressed by practices such as docking piglets' tails, which can be done without pain relief on piglets under seven days of age. And mother pigs are typically put into these crates five days before giving birth and remain there until their piglets are weaned at around four weeks of age. There is a lot of debate over whether farrowing crates save lives. Industry commonly refers to the crates as maternity wards for sows, arguing that they protect piglets from being crushed. Research indicates on average that one or two piglets are saved per litter compared to outdoor farms. There's possibly no significant difference in mortality rates, but the causes of mortality differ according to the farming system. So for example, starvation and stillbirth tend to occur more often indoors, whereas crushing occurs more often outdoors. 
So it appears there may be some merit in using crates to prevent some crushing, but there's the inescapable fact that crushing only arises because breeding practices in New Zealand and around the world produce unnaturally large cells with unnaturally large litters who are kept in intensive con confinement. And the sacrificing of the welfare of cells in order to protect piglets has become standard practice. However, it's important to note that New Zealand's animal welfare legislation doesn't authorise any such trade-off in the welfare between mother pigs and piglets. And there's also other well-documented safety issues. Um, one in particular is that these farrowing crate systems are very prone to fire because heat pads are used for piglets. And where fires have occurred, generally there's a total loss of life because there's no chance for pigs to escape from cages. And this has been borne out um, in New Zealand and around the world where thousands of pigs have perished in fires. So there's been a great deal of activism on farrowing crates in New Zealand for many years in the lead up to litigation. And farrowing crates were the subject of one of the largest ever parliamentary petitions organised by the animal rights group SAFE. Um, the applicants in this case were the New Zealand Animal Law Association, or NZALA, which is a coalition of volunteer lawyers, of which I'm a member, and SAFE, or Save Animals from Exploitation, a non-profit animal rights organisation where I was the former, um, a, a former campaigns manager. The respondents were the Minister of Agriculture and the National Animal Welfare Advisory Committee, or NAWAC, and this has been established as one of two purportedly independent bodies set up to advise the Minister of Agriculture. So the case was a judicial review of regulations 26 and 27 of the Animal Welfare Care and Procedures Reg Regulations and minimum standards 10 and 11 of the 2018 Code of Welfare for Pigs. So regulations and codes of welfare are subordinate or secondary legislation issued under the primary legislation, the Animal Welfare Act. Regulation 26 set minimum requirements for the use of farrowing crates. It allowed for crates that are big enough for the pig to be able to stand and not touch one of the crate sides. Regulation 27 prohibited confining pigs to sow stalls other than for mating. The 2018 code allowed for the use of crates and stalls as a minimum standard of practice. Farrowing crates and sow stalls have always been considered to be non-compliant with the Animal Welfare Act because they do not allow pigs to display normal patterns of behaviour as required by the Act. However, in 2015, Parliament signalled its intention to phase out non-compliant practices by repealing the exceptional circumstances exemption and enacting regulation-making powers, and these prescribe timeframes for transitioning from non-compliant practices to practices that fully meet the obligations of the Animal Welfare Act, and this transition timeframe was typically 10 years. Following decisions and recommendations of NAWAC, the Minister recommended two regulations and amendments to minimum standards that did not require a transition timeframe, so this would allow the use of farrowing crates to continue indefinitely. So the applicants in this case challenged the validity of these two regulations and the two minimum standards on the grounds of unlawfulness and or unreasonableness. Firstly, that the 2018 code allowed for minimum standards that contravened the Act's purpose. And secondly, that the Minister and NAWAC wrongly recommended regulations based off the 2018 code's non-compliant minimum standards. The applicant sought a declaration that the two regulations and the 2018 code be declared invalid. So in a decision issued in November last year, the court agreed with the applicants that regulations 26 and 27 and minimum standards 10 and 11 were contrary to the purpose of the Animal Welfare Act and therefore invalid. However, the court stopped short at declaring the full 2018 code as invalid. Since the 2018 code and regulations allowed for farrowing crates and mating stalls without any indication of when they'd be phased out, they undermined Parliament's intention that non-compliant practices such as this would and should be phased out. And since they undermined Parliament's intention, they were ultra vires or beyond the power given by Parliament to the government and therefore unlawful. And the judge directed the minister to consider enacting new regulations that would phase out the use of mating stalls and farrowing crates. So since the judgment was issued, the government has agreed on a five-year time frame for the phase-out of farrowing crates. So they'll be phased out by the 18th of December 2025. I'd now just like to spend a few minutes talking about the live export campaign that I was leading in my previous role for SAFE. 
So some very brief background. Most of the animals that New Zealand exports are day-old chicks, almost two and a half million of them last year, and cows. The number of live cows exported from New Zealand has increased. There's been an almost eight-fold increase since um, 2018, with uh, almost 110,000 exported last year. The vast majority of cows are exported to China, where they are likely to spend their lives in intensive farms and are eventually slaughtered, often by methods that would be illegal in New Zealand. So, for example, without pre-slaughter stunning. Now, it's impossible to verify housing, transport and slaughter conditions of New Zealand cows in China due to transparency issues. So a 2003 disaster involving a shipment of New Zealand and Australian sheep to Saudi Arabia led the New Zealand government to suspend the live export of sheep for slaughter. This ban was subsequently expanded to all livestock, which is defined as including cattle, sheep, deer and goats. Legally speaking, this ban is a conditional prohibition on the live export of these animals for slaughter. This means that these animals can't be exported for slaughter without the prior approval of the Ministry of Primary Industries or MPI. So there haven't been any live exports for slaughter from New Zealand of these animals since 2008. However, New Zealand has continued to export livestock for breeding. So in 2019, there was an ABC News expose which revealed suffering of New Zealand and Australian cows in Sri Lanka. And in response to that, the government announced a review of the live export trade, which would consider a range of options from improving the existing systems to a complete ban. There was a lot of activism um, going on and campaigning by animal rights groups, primarily SAFE, and also by locals in areas where the cows were being exported from. In September last year, the Gulf Livestock One capsized and sank off the coast of Japan on the way to China. The almost 6,000 New Zealand cows on board died at sea, along with 41 of the 43 crew members, including two New Zealanders. Following this disaster, the Ministry for Primary Industries announced that it would temporarily suspend live export by sea, and they launched another review into the welfare of animals during sea voyages. Upon completion of this review, live export resumed with a few tweaks around the edges, some new regulations, for example, decreasing the allowable stocking density on ships and increasing the amount of food that must be carried on ships. In April this year, the Minister for Agriculture announced a ban on the live export of animals by sea, with a wind down period of up to two years. A couple of months later, the government announced that the export of live animals by sea would continue for another two years, so the wind down period would essentially be the maximum indicated. So while this is a victory of sorts for animals for sure, um, it's still concerning that live export will be continuing for two years. And there's also the issue of live animals exported by air, which no doubt will be another area that animal advocates will be tackling in the future. And we're also still awaiting confirmation as to the nature of the ban. Will it be an absolute ban or will it be a conditional prohibition akin to the prohibition on live export for slaughter? And what impact will that have in practice, whether it's absolute or conditional? So these two developments via litigation and campaigning are certainly victories. However, a lot of work remains to be done. A few areas that I see as particularly interesting and worthy of focus include comprehensively reviewing all codes of welfare and regulations, so the secondary legislation issued under the Animal Welfare Act, assessing whether these are consistent with the primary legislation, providing advice on reissuing these codes and regulations, and where necessary, possibly looking at further judicial review. Also advocating and campaigning for increased funding for enforcement and policy development in animal welfare and an independent commissioner for animals. And a particular area of interest of mine is aquatic animals. There's no code of welfare for farmed fish currently in New Zealand. And as in many other jurisdictions, there's just generally less protection for aquatic animals, including in New Zealand, those who are exported live to other countries. The saving grace for aquatic animals in New Zealand is that unlike in many other jurisdictions, fish and some other aquatic animals such as crabs, lobsters and cephalopods are covered by our Animal Welfare Act. So I look forward to continuing my journey in animal law, continuing to develop my expertise and most of all working together with other lawyers, animal welfare experts and others in New Zealand and around the world. Together I believe that we can ensure that collaboratively we will transform our relationship with animals. E hara taku toa i te toa takitahi, ingari he toa takitini. My strength is not as an individual, but as a collective. Thank you.
Um, greetings, esteemed uh, participants of this conference. Um, I am Jim Karani, and today I'll be speaking on to the status of wildlife crime in Africa, and especially focusing on conservation efforts on Africa's most iconic and endangered wildlife, being elephants and rhinos. So I represent um, the Lawyers for Animal Protection in Africa, a nonprofit that was formed by um, you know, former alumni of the Lewis and Clark Law School who have majored and focused their interest on animal law. And we are purely engaged in wildlife crime research, law enforcement capacity building, monitoring and evaluation of processes that strengthen law enforcement response to animal law issues, especially wildlife crime. I've worked previously with campaigns like the Hands of Elephants campaign, um, which was specifically targeted and focused to addressing the plight of elephants, as most of you know, a decade ago. Um, elephants were heavily poached in Africa, with Kenya at least losing around 300 elephants per year. Um, and at first, when we started this campaign, um, the government branded us as noisemakers, as tribal rousers, as people who were only interested in you know, making the government look bad. But once we showed the data and showed the people just how bad the government was protecting wildlife, we were able to get to this critical mass um, of support um, and the public was able to demand that the government had to do something about it. Um, and as we speak today, um, Kenya has one of the strongest wildlife law legislations. And I think uh, based on the data that the government has just reduced, we have brought down the poaching of elephants by 85% in the country. And our elephant population has doubled. But this situation is now mirrored across Africa. Um, when you look at the data and the numbers, um, the Great Elephant Census that was done um, shows that elephants have decreased by over 30% across all range states. There are some places where elephants are doing well and there are some places where elephants are doing really, really badly. Like in Kenya, they are almost, almost getting out of the endangered status. But in Tanzania, which is our neighbor, they are critically endangered. And as of today, I will show you the two major risks that are affecting and creating this state of affairs. Well, as you all, all of you may know, illegal wildlife trade is huge. It's a global business that is north, northwards up to $10 billion per year. And it is ranked on the same level as drugs counterfeiting human trafficking and, of course, arms trade. Um, and it has turned out to be the fifth most lucrative criminal industry being perpetrated by you know, criminal gangs and organized crime all over Africa. This endangered national security, as most of the, you know, rebel organization, terrorist groups in Africa, some of them have been linked with, you know, illegal wildlife trafficking. And of course, it endangers the livelihoods of many Africans in Africa because purely it endangered, it endangers, you know, tourism revenues. And of course, there is the obvious social costs. I mean, it is the loss of some of our most iconic um, and, you know, pro uh, protected and cherished animals across Africa. And of course, the social costs associated with it. Over 1,000 rangers have died in the last decade due to poaching and in engagements with, with poachers. I urge all of you to find out more of how these key species are being illegally threatened by illegal wildlife trade as this cuts across the board it's our zebras it's giraffes it's pangolins it's lizards it's snakes it's our fish there's a lot that's been taken out and by me just focusing on elephants and rhinos i hope to just give you a glimpse as to how bad this is so just to show you the, quickly the trafficking chain which most of you may be aware of it clearly goes through a value chain um, where poachers low rank low, low rank poachers uh, commit the crime of poaching pass it over to brokers who pass it over to intermediaries who now carry it across our borders and then it ends up into wholesale traders and retailers abroad. But today I truly wanted to focus on one key thing. How do they do it? Possibly by knowing how they do it, we can actually have a chance at cracking how they do it and probably, you know, doing something about it. This slide shows you the ingenuity of wildlife traffickers. In 2016, I was part of a crack team that was following up the illegal wildlife trade from Central Africa into Asia. And what we were able to do is to follow what were um, shipments of timber from South Sudan headed to Cambodia. Upon closer scrutiny, we were able to find um, export timber 
which with wildlife rangers we were shocked to find 1.9 tons of elephant ivory cleverly concealed in what looked like carved wood timber logs that were carved into to look like coffins and covered with wax to to make sure that you know donkeys don't identify anything in fact to your right uh, of this slide you will notice a ranger with a sniffer dog uh, you know quickly asking it is it that you can't detect that there's ivory down there it's pretty much him uh, you know resigning to his fate that the dog couldn't even smell the ivory despite being trained and despite being you know uh, well conditioned to be able to sniff to sniff this out um, so the wax was put there by illegal wildlife traders to make sure that sniffer dogs can detect it we brought in two other dogs and they seriously couldn't see it um, when you look at the ivory on the left slide you will notice that this is um, ivory from forest elephants and uh, you can quickly see markers on it, which are markers that, which are usually put there uh, for purposes of identification for reporting to the Convention of International Trade in, Ele in Endangered Species. What we were able to discover, unfortunately, is that this is ivory that was stolen from a government um, facility in Burundi and was now being, you know, exported to Cambodia and other Asian countries. This just shows you um, the ingenuity of you know, wildlife traffickers and their level of connections, um, you know, for them to be able to get into such a facility and take all of this ivory was in itself shocking. So what we've been able to notice is that from seizure data, we've noticed that a lot of, you know, ivory is going all over again to Vietnam, China and Cambodia, despite all the protections that have been put in there, despite all of the checks that have been put into customs, despite all the amount of money that has been put into demand reduction. To move on to the second issue, which is seriously affecting uh, wildlife, it is land use. Now, on my slide is this shiny brand new railway that we have uh, traversing what is 500 kilometers or 800 miles um, across Kenya. And it's a magnificent um, you know, infrastructure development, something that we need, something that Kenya needs. But you will notice um, to the top right corner of the slide that they put it smack in the middle of one of the most sensitive habitats in East Africa, in the Savo National Parks. The red heat maps show you where most our elephants congregate, live and, you know, exist. And they couldn't have put it in a worse place in as much as they put it smack through the middle of it. And most of you may know some of this infrastructure development come with a lot of effects. And as a result, they have increased and heightened what we call human wildlife conflict, but I would call human wildlife entanglements. This is where the existence of wildlife and the existence of human beings is put at loggerheads to a point where either wildlife or human beings or both suffer. As a result, um, we've taken um, a lot of initiatives to do public interest litigation to make sure that you know, the government understands that environmental protection is something they have to really, really uh, consider keenly and they need to stay away from some of this. So we have we have had a couple of uh, victories. We have had a couple of defeats in court, but we will never tire into, you know, making sure the government is taken into account and completely conserve the environment. The other issue I want to talk about on this slide is land use. Now, this is a photo from uh, one of my uncles who lives right next to the forest, and he chose to grow corn right where elephants pass through. So I've always told him that his land use is incompatible with elephant conservation. So most of the elephants, you know, spend a lot of time in his farm, you know, eating his products. So this is legitimately one of those issues where we are trying to transform how people look at land use. Now he's fully aware that his land use has to be compatible with wildlife conservation or he will always be in losses. So what does justice for wildlife look like in my continent? So this is purely an issue of one, we must strengthen law enforcement. We must truly really make sure that all suspects are brought to book and are brought to justice. We must help our law enforcement understand that proper crime scene examination and evaluation, proper you know, um, storage of evidence, proper process of evidence uh, is necessary. We must impart knowledge on our prosecutors to make sure they use all these tools available to them, to make sure that they are able to forfeit the proceeds of ivory traders who clearly are making a buck out of this. And we must be able to turn what are proceeds of crime into outright sources of where we can fund uh, conservation. I will not tire until the day I see money taken away from a wildlife trafficker being put solely into elephant protection. Secondly, we need more space for wildlife. I mean, with conservation success comes this other burden of 
where will these animals go? There's so many of them and they can't live in the same space they used to. So we have to create more parks, more conservancies, more areas where animals can call a habitat. And this is where it is key and central that we bring in communities and we talk keenly to them so that they can be able to understand that them living with wildlife is not a burden, but in itself a blessing. And we must turn it into a way that they, be, they are able to truly understand what this means. It's quite shocking that all over Africa, um, you know, the national park, which is America's best idea, has not truly been adopted fully. The national parks that were set up in colonial times are still the same ones we still have. The same space, or even lesser. But we haven't added new national parks, we are not adding new national reserves. But communities, on the other hand, communities have been busy. Communities have been busy setting aside their lands to make sure that wildlife have more space. Communities have been literally living along with this wildlife. Some are ridiculously destructive and they are bearing the costs of taking care of conservation. Communities are bearing the brunt of environmental justice, where the costs and benefits, where the benefits of tourism are going to a select few, but the costs of tourism and conservation are literally being shouldered and borne by communities. We need to truly support communities if we want wildlife like this to coexist. This is a photo um, that clearly shows you just how much our community rangers live with these animals. This is an, an abandoned orphan which was taken care of by communities for almost four weeks before rangers came to pick it up. I mean, it shows you just how much sympathy and so much empathy is among our community members such that they're able to coexist with such iconic wildlife. So the formula is simple. Let's help law enforcement crack down on illegal wildlife traders. Let us find means to truly strengthen law enforcement. And then three, let's add more space for wildlife. And four, we truly have to work with communities as they are the only ones who are conserving wildlife. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, my presentation is going to be about animal litigation in Pakistan. So the cases that I'm going to be talking about, um, both of them, obviously, uh, the main, the focus of both these cases is to improve the situation for animals in Pakistan. Um, both of these cases are pending before the Lahore High Court, which is the equivalent of the state Supreme Court um, in, in the province of Punjab, where I am situated. So the case that I have filed, uh, Harun Ali Sethi versus the province of Punjab, the petitioners are basically, uh, we have three petitioners. Two of them are individuals who were involved in feeding and caring for stray dogs outside of their offices or their residence. And those dogs were brutally, unfortunately, um, shot and poisoned by state authorities. And the respondents, of course, in the petition are those various departments of the provincial and local governments that are responsible for carrying out dog culling. So our first main argument is there is no legal mandate for state authorities to kill dogs um, in the manner that it's done, which is through either shooting them or poisoning them. And there is no law that explicitly allows, explicitly or implicitly allows for dog culling. And definitely no law that allows for dog culling to happen in the manner in which it takes place. And the second argument that we advance is that dog culling doesn't help achieve any policy purpose. And that's because usually these authorities, the reasons they put forth, and even in our petition, the reasons they put forth is that um, dog culling helps to eradicate rabies or that it helps to control dog populations. And that's simply not true because, and we've uh, appended plenty of research that indicates that uh, it, for eradicating rabies, vaccinating 70% of the dog population is the most effective way to go. And this research has been around since the 1970s. So it's not even any kind, it's, it's not even recent scientific research. And in fact, when you cull dogs, you actually remove vaccinated dogs from the dog population, which actually helps to spread disease as opposed to eradicating disease. So it's actually counterproductive to cull dogs um, for rabies control. And also for dog population control, we've appended research that shows that dog culling, and it's not even about research, dog culling in Pakistan has been happening for decades, 
and the population of dogs is clearly not decreasing. But fine, even if you don't go off of that anecdotal evidence, um, there's also scientific research uh, that shows that trap, neuter, vaccinate, release, TNVR, uh, is far more effective than dog culling and even controlling dog populations. And dog population control is, is the reason why it's even touted as a policy purpose is because when dog populations increase, then dog-human conflict increases, chances of dogs biting people increases. Um, and so one of the arguments that we put forth there as well is that you don't remove the source of the of, of you know why the dog population is increasing, which is um, trash. So there's a lot of trash, especially in urban cities uh, in Pakistan, including Lahore. Uh, and you know state authorities aren't cleaning up the trash effectively. And so more and more packs of dogs are attracted to those urban areas. And hence, because then they populate those areas, um, there's more, they, they, you know, come into conflict with local residents. And then obviously the third argument we take is that just this indiscriminate culling of dogs violates fundamental statutory and constitutional rights of both humans and animals. And the reason why we can now make this argument as strongly as we can is thanks to the Islamabad High Court judgment that came out last year in May 2020 um, in the Kavan case in which the Islamabad High Court held that uh, the right to life protected under Article 9 of our constitution extends to animals, to non-human animals. And so then the relief we seek in our petition is um, obviously we, we seek a declaration that killing dogs in the manner that it happens is, is illegal and that the respondents should be immediately and permanently restrained from doing so. Um, we seek a direction that the livestock department, which is the department responsible for vaccinating animals against diseases such as rabies, uh, they start a mass vaccination program and they vaccinate stray dogs so that if you do, if you, if the state really is interested in eradicating rabies, um, this is the, then they'd go about it the right way and in the way that's actually mandated under uh, the law, which is the Punjab Animal Health Act. We also seek a direction that the respondents put in place adequate procedures um, in which they identify specific dogs against whom the complaints are received and not just go around indiscriminately killing dogs. And then they figure out a process in which, okay, if they do receive a complaint against a dog, how do they go about uh, addressing that complaint? Do, they can detain the dog, they can try to rehome the dog. And even if in the worst case scenario, they do have to use an ice dog, it should be done humanely and not definitely not in the way it's carried out right now. And for this purpose, they can frame bylaws or regulations um, under existing animal cruelty laws, for instance, is, our, uh, is, is what we seek. Um, and lastly, we seek a holistic provincial policy, which sets, sets minimum standards for dog population control and which has elements of trap, neuter, vaccinate and release. And the dog culling petition is currently pending. The current status as of the date of this presentation is that the respondents have agreed to put in place a provincial uh, trap, neuter, vaccinate, vaccinate release policy. And the court is kind of overseeing that process. And we're just waiting for the policy to be finalized so that um, dog culling can be banned in in the province of Punjab permanently and a more humane procedure for controlling dog population is put in place. So fingers crossed on that front. Um, the second petition that I'm going to be talking about is the petition which challenges the constitutionality of the provincial wildlife law that we have. Um, and the reason why this petition comes about is because in, pa in, in at least the province of Punjab where I am, uh, a lot of there's a growing trend of keeping uh, wild animals, specifically lions, wolves, giraffes as pets, as companion animals. And uh, because of that, those animals, obviously, they're not cared for properly. They're not kept in uh, proper, you know, enclosures, conditions. And there are actually there's been a lot of instances of abuse against those animals um, that's been uh, making the rounds on social media. So the impetus behind this petition was uh, one of those incidents where someone was uh, filmed on video beating a lion cub that they'd kept as a companion animal. And so this petition basically says that it should be illegal to keep any wild animal, even if you obtain a license for it, it it's, it's unconstitutional, it should be illegal. Because I am amicus, uh, I submitted an amicus uh, brief in this petition. My amicus brief obviously is quite pro-animal. And uh, I basically talk about the laws that protect wild animals, including going into the uh, pr the Punjab Wildlife Act, which is under challenge here, and uh, discussing how one of the main purposes of that law is to protect animals. And so even if you don't 
say that the, the the provision of the law that allows someone to possess wild animals is illegal per se or unconstitutional per se it's definitely illegal to keep those animals as companion animals because nowhere does the law if you read the law in its entirety envision a situation in which someone's possessing a wild animal for the purpose of keeping it as a companion animal just some background to this amicus brief is that the court in this case was very interested in uh, a couple of things such as just comparing how animals are protected in other jurisdictions especially obviously wild animals and then also the petitioners in this case didn't really have a nexus with people who keep lions as pets they basically brought this petition as a public interest litigation saying this is a matter of public interest and therefore the court should hear it but they weren't impacted as such by someone abusing a lion for instance right and so the court was really interested in seeing whether animals would have standing a what the petitioner standing was but then also whether animals could have standing to bring the suit by themselves and so i think this was a this was a really kind of interesting opening to address this question of whether animals could ever have standing even though this suit in particular wasn't brought on behalf of an animal it was still a person instituting the suit but the question that the court was interested in was definitely whether legal person or is something that could be explored in a jurisdiction like pakistan for non human animals and so um in my amicus brief i talked about all of that case law that we have around the world where animals have been granted legal personhood or where organizations are attempting to get legal personhood for animals of course mentioning the non human rights project for instance um or cases in india uh, which is our neighboring jurisdiction and again which has a lot of persuasive uh, jurisprudence that pakistani judges often use where animals or the natural world has been granted legal personhood and then obviously statutory law from other jurisdictions that talk about protecting wild animals and so the main suggestion we had for the court through our amicus brief was that since in pakistan superior courts have previously held that the court can issue directions to the executive to enact guidelines or handbooks or regulations or to even amend existing laws we suggested that the court not declare that it be uh, it's unconstitutional to possess a wild animal but that under the current law the respondents can frame rules and regulations that protect animals more than the current rules and regulations do that's our main suggestion and then the conclusions that we reach in our amicus brief and when i say we i mean my firm because the amicus brief is going on behalf of my firm so sorry for the confusion between i and we again we talk about the purpose of the law which is to protect wild animals and it doesn't and also that the law doesn't envision keeping wild animals captive as domestic pets or as companion animals so if any licenses are being issued for this purpose those licenses are definitely ultra vires the act itself and so those licenses should be set aside and declared illegal and without jurisdiction but not the provision of the law itself because striking down uh, or getting the court to declare a provision of the law unconstitutional is definitely a much harder or in a much higher standard to meet um then saying that the licenses that have been issued under this provision um are is not what the provision envis- envisages and then we also talk about obviously the delegated legislation all of the rules currently framed under the 1974 act and we and we suggest that those rules uh do not currently address the welfare of those animals um which is one of the purposes of the 1974 act and they don't put in place adequate safeguards to protect those animals from cruelty and abuse and because our our uh, prevent our cruelty prevention of cruelty to animals act applies only to domestic animals wild animals are then kind of left in the state of flux where there's no law that really protects them and then we more generally then we make this argument that animals are right bearing beings under pakistani law because we do have all of these uh different statutes such as the wildlife statute that envisages envisages protecting animals the prevention of cruelty to animals act our penal code which uh, criminalizes certain acts committed against certain crimes committed against animals and so because under statute those animals have certain rights that are protected you can't say that they you we might not go as far as to say they're legal persons but they're definitely not again objects or property because they do there is a recognition under the law that they can experience pain and that they're sentient so they are right bearing beings in that sense and so when you're subjecting animals to unnecessary pain and suffering you are violating some rights that they have under the law and also again we use the common judgment we rely, we rely heavily on the common judgment to say that it's also violative of constitutional rights that the court now recognizes that animals have 
And then, of course, we suggest that detailed rules and regulations should be framed, and the court does have the power to direct the respondents to frame such regulations to protect animals um, and to protect those natural rights that, are, that the law guarantees for them. And lastly, on the issue of standing, say because animals are right-bearing beings and because the provision of our constitution that deals with uh, with someone bringing an application to court doesn't use the term person at all. It uses the term aggrieved party, um, which is different from using person. So then we draw that distinction and we say that because animals are right-bearing beings, um, they do have uh, they, they do have some standing uh, to to be an aggrieved party and to bring suit through an individual, maybe, but to bring suit before uh, the court if those statutory rights that they have under Pakistani law are violated. And also um, just, and then we also talk a little bit about public interest litigation in general. And, you know, if public interest is impacted, then the individual doesn't have to be connected to the issue to bring suit, um, which the petitioners have done in this case. This petition is also currently pending, and the court, uh, it was filed quite recently, so the arguments haven't been made yet. Uh, we haven't even argued our amicus brief yet. Hopefully, uh, the court will uh, dig into some of these issues, and some of these issues that are cropping up in Pakistan for the first time, legal standing being one of them uh, for animals. And uh, I'm super excited about uh, this, this petition as well, both of them, but this one because of this reason. And uh, yeah, it's an exciting time to be litigating for animals in Pakistan, especially following the Garvin case. Thank you again for having me. Hello, everyone. The title of my presentation is How far can we go with our animal law LLM? Basically, when I decided to pursue my LLM in animal law, I had many doubts and questions. The main one was what might be my actual possibilities or chances to practice as an animal lawyer, specifically here in South America, in Chile. On the contrary to what I thought at the beginning, there are many ways to use this LLM as an effective tool to advocate for the interest of non-human animals from different approaches. In the following, I will let you know about the projects I'm developing as an animal lawyer in Chile, all of them inspired in my experience as a house alumni, and hopefully this will inspire others to venture into this area of professional development, which seems to have pretty good chances even in countries like Chile. So let's start. Okay. Let's talk about the Center for Chilean Animal Law Studies, Sila Chile. During November 2019, while still pursuing my LLM in animal law back there in Portland, Oregon, I founded Sila Chile, which is the first center specialized in Chilean animal law. Sila's goal is to contribute to the development of this area in Chile and thus advance non-human interest in our cultural discourses. Among the many activities we are carrying out through this platform, we can uh, list the following ones. For example, legal research. The legal research area is integrated by 30 people, including lead researchers and collaborators, who develop 11 research-based projects on topics as diverse as wild animals, industrial animal production, aquaculture, animal experimentation, post-abolitionist approaches, and even veganism. So far, we have concluded six original research-based projects. At Sida Chile, we also organize academic activities in universities and schools. We also host webinars through our platforms. We have co-organized seminars on animal law in important universities here in Chile. And we have also co-organized international academic events. Around 20 volunteers from Chile and abroad are collaborating in this area of this NGO. Another interesting project of SIDA Chile is the Intersectional Literature Area, or SIDA Ally. During the year 2021, we founded this SIDA Ally area with the purpose of promoting the development of non-legal literary works aimed at intersectional justice and mainly promoting animal, feminist, LGBT plus and indigenous perspectives. 
This area is headed by a director who is an expert in literature and American aesthetics, and she is currently focusing on different formats, for example, uh, as novels, short stories, poems, songs, comics, fan scenes, among many others. But here in Ciudad Chile, we are also carrying out other kinds of activities. For example, we have issued expert opinions or, or reports on upcoming bills. We have participated in some abolitionist campaigns, for example, seeking the abolition of SUS in Chile. And we have also signed partnership agreements with NGOs from all over the world, for, for example, from South America, from Europe, from Asia, in order to promote technical exchange and academic cooperation. However, we have been talking about the dogmatic development of animal law, but in order to separate this kind of work from, the, from activism, during um, the year 2021, I founded the Interspecies Justice Foundation, which is a legally constituted NGO and attending to interspecies and intersectional justice through the use of legal, social, and cultural mechanisms. Among the many activities we have developed through this NGO, we can mention the following ones. For example, through the Foundation's activism area, we have organized workshops on animal activism and discussion cycles about the invisibility of animal exploitation. In addition, we have participated in specific campaigns, such as the one that seeks the extradition of a New Zealand citizen accused of having killed 1,500 cows in Chile by using a hammer, a horrible case of animal cruelty. And currently, this area is formed by seven people, and we hope to increase our staff as the time goes by. Another interesting project we are developing through Interspecies Justice Foundation is the campaign Subjects Not Objects. Basically, along with other NGOs, we are carrying out this campaign which seeks to include non-human animals as legal subjects in the new Chilean constitution. A representative of our campaign had a hearing with the Human Rights Commission of the Constitutional Convention, which is the entity in charge of the drafting of this new constitution, receiving positive criticism. In addition, we have participated in demonstrations in support of this initiative in the surroundings of the former National Congress, where the Commission is stationed in Great Britain. Another interesting project we are developing through Justicia Interespecie is uh, the strategic litigation plans we have for next year. Right now, the legal innovation area along with the strategic litigation area of the NGO, are beginning to work on what will be the filing of a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of a great ape confined in a zoo in Santiago. This habeas corpus will be filed during the year 2022 and will probably be the first one filed on behalf of a non-human animal in Chile. In addition, we plan to develop litigation and at exploring some professional development possibilities for future animal lawyers. For example, trying or testing some formulas that may or may not work regarding divorce with animals. And finally, uh, we are in the process of registering Justicia Interespecie as a trademark authorized to operate in Chile as a publisher, printer, and distributor of books and magazines. Our goal is to create the first animal publishing house in Chile to promote the production and distribution of literary works dealing with these issues. This will give us total control over the contents we deem necessary to promote. So hopefully during the next year we plan to produce the first copies of two collective works, one on animal law and the other one on intersectional literature. Now. The question is, can we go even further? Along with the above, in the medium term, I, I plan to work on the following future projects, so please don't tell anyone, because this is between you and me. First, during the next few months, I plan to contact the universities in Chile with the aim of proposing a special class on animal law in their law schools. The program is already draft, so I hope to I will get a, a positive answer. I will let you know. 
In addition, together with some colleagues, we plan to design and teach specialized and paid workshops in animal law. This will not only contribute to the development of this area in Syria and abroad, but will also allow us to make a living from this activity, hopefully. And maybe the most interesting project I will be working on in the next few months is the creation of the first animal law firm in Chile. Why? Although I have managed to carry out several activities and initiatives related to animal law and animals, so far I have not been able to complete a transition to an exclusive animal law practice. However, uh, a few weeks ago I decided to venture into what will be the next big step in my career as an animal lawyer, which will be the creation of the first animal law firm in Chile. To this end, I intend to offer unprecedented services in the Chilean legal market to individuals, NGOs, administrations, and maybe, if it's possible, to companies. All of them related to uh, different topics, for example, cohabitation or coexistence conflicts, family matters, civil liability, animal abuse, consulting, among many, many others. So basically, as you can see, there are many ways in which we can use our animal legal training to serve non-human animals. So I really hope my experience may inspire others to follow this beautiful path of professional development. Thank you all and see you later. That includes the presenter portion or the presentation portion of this uh, session. Now we're gonna move to the q and I'm gonna start with a question directed for Bianca. What advice would you give to animal advocates in other countries who are trying to secure a live export ban? Okay, thank you. Um, I think like advocacy on other animal issues, um, the best strategy to achieve a live export ban will be somewhat dependent on social and political factors in the country in which you're working. However, I think I can offer some general advice which would be relevant um, in different contexts. So firstly, I'd say um, try to adopt a multi-pronged approach wherever possible. So this might include a public awareness campaign to garner um, public support for a ban, um, political lobbying, grassroots activism, and potentially even litigation um, exposing or challenging the legality of live export laws, um, perhaps on procedural and or substantive grounds. I think also while it's important, of course, to highlight the animal welfare impacts of live export, uh, I think you have to be strategic in terms of the arguments that you use and political and, and economic realities dictate that you have to hone your arguments or tally your arguments very carefully. So while I'm not privy to the discussions that led up to the New Zealand decision to ban live export, I have no doubt that um, New Zealand's or the risk to New Zealand's international reputation played a very large role in the decision to ban live export. Um, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, essentially all the cows that New Zealand is exporting are exported to China and China also happens to be New Zealand's main trading partner. So I would think that the New Zealand government would have had fairly serious concerns about the risk to the country's reputation um, in order to put that relationship with China at risk by banning that trade. Um, another point I think is that it's important to highlight the human casualties of the live export trade. So as we're seeing increasingly being exposed in the deep sea fishing industry and um, with slaughterhouses and in intensive animal agriculture more generally, um, industries that involve animal suffering typically also involve human suffering. Um, and as I mentioned with the sinking of the Gulf Livestock One in 2020, almost 6,000 cows perished, but 41 human lives were also lost. So I think intersectional approaches are particularly relevant here as we've seen in um, the environmental justice movement I think it's really important to highlight um, the impact on, uh, on humans as well as on animals. Um, highlighting that it's a global ban, so, so for example, looking at New Zealand as a precedent for a ban and also highlighting what other countries or regions are doing, for example, um, in the EU where a move has been signalled um, to move away from live export and also in the UK where um, a ban on live export for slaughter and fattening is currently being progressed through Parliament as part of a um, broader suite of measures in the um, animal, animal Welfare Kept Animals Bill. 
And finally, I think, especially in the context of COVID-19, drawing on the One Health approach to strengthen your argument can be really impactful. Um, obviously, the pandemic highlights that we exist in a global community um, and reconfirms the link between intensive animal agriculture and international transport of animals in confined spaces and an increased risk of zoonotic disease. So I think the One Health approach has a lot to offer here in highlighting um, the interconnectedness of animal, human and uh, environmental health. Thank you, Bianca. Uh, this next question is for Jim. Uh, you touched upon the topic of human wildlife entanglements in this area of local agriculture. In this regard, I'm wondering if, or um, the uh, individual is wondering if you could share what remedies you and your group have advanced to protect wildlife while safeguarding livelihoods. Well, um, the, the first the first realization we've made is that um, fences won't work. We can't fence in all the parks and national reserves. Uh, I mean, we have to allow animals to move around and connect with each other. But um, we have started in, um, you know, um, helping the government um, be able to educate the people on compensation schemes. Most Kenyans are not aware of how easily they can unlock uh, payments and benefits from this. And as, as a result, we've developed a lot of toolkits and guides to the law and trying to just dump um, down the law to a level which you know every other Kenyan can connect with it and know how easy they can access compensation, especially when they use their crops to wildlife. The other bit is uh, we are now pioneering with a couple of private sector industries to set up what we call you know crop crop insurance schemes that you know which is in an area where we have figured out that conservation by itself cannot solve all the problems that are currently there and some of these problems problems are ridiculously expensive. Uh, the other one is that we're now working a lot with communities to either help them unlock their land to better land use or be dedicate their land purely to conservation. I think most of you may not be aware of this, but 80%, more than 80% of Kenya's wildlife is not within national parks. Only 20% is. The rest is in community land and wildlife corridors and habitats. This is where it actually truly does matter to connect with you know, communities for them to know how easily they can unlock, um, for example, um, future payments in ecosystem services. This is an area where we want to, dire to, to direct, direct um, benefits, direct economic benefits to communities who maybe have uh, felt like our message of you know um, telling them that wildlife is important is not enough now by actually bringing in an extra benefit to it they can find me say oh this one thing that we that we actually conserving for our heritage is also you know um, you know contributing some value to the land that we're giving up so those two education and access to compensation and then of course the third one is more space for wildlife thank you so much Jim and uh, the next question is for Hira you mentioned some flaws in Pakistan's animal welfare laws. Is there any sense that the legislature is looking to improve these laws? Or do you have a sense that in light of the Kavan ruling and these other cases that some in the legislature are looking to weaken these laws? Uh, I think that's an excellent question. And I'm pleased to report that it's actually the former. So um, in light of all of this litigation that's happening, of uh, various province provinces because animal wealth is something that's uh, legislated on a federal level. Um, and the provinces are looking to update uh, their animal welfare laws. And uh, I'm a personally, I've personally been involved in that process of updating our animal welfare legislation because the current anti-cruelty law in most provinces is from 1890s. So it's a colonial era, era law. And so far I've drafted uh, updated animal welfare laws for three of the four provinces that we have. Um, here in Pakistan and uh, various groups are now looking to kind of push that legislation through um, and hopefully get it passed in like maybe a year or two. So that's that's just super exciting and that's a that's a very positive development that's come out of all of this litigation that's happening in Pakistan. Thank you, Hira. And the next question is for Diego. I'm curious if you could speak more about how your group envisions animals being uh, subjects in Chile's new constitution. In essence, what rights or interests would animals have? Well, so far we have not proposed any specific right because we don't think it will be useful from a tactical point of view or perspective because people in the Constitutional Convention may not be uh, like okay with the idea of recognizing specific rights on, for animals. But um, personally, I get a little bit romantic and start thinking about Gary Francione's idea of recognizing the right for every animal to not, not to be property of others. But then after that, I think that 
maybe that answer came come from this sort of use naturalist perspective and trying to like land this idea in the use positivist perspective of uh, the Chilean legal system. It may be interesting to recognize to her animals the right to life in first place, to physical and psychological integrity, also to freedom of movement, and maybe to be represented by a lawyer in court. And this whole right should be complemented with uh, the existence of a public administration aimed at promoting animal rights in Chile and protecting those interests, and also with a state or governmental duty aimed at protecting those interests. And finally, I think it's also really important to create um, a broad legal standing actions uh, to let everyone in Chile to act on behalf of a non-human animal in front of the court. Thank you, Diego. Okay, I have one more question for Bianca, and then um, we'll we'll end the session. So, do you foresee future litigation in New Zealand challenging other codes of welfare? Yes, I do. New Zealand's not a typically litigious um, country, but I think the Farrow and Crate decision I talked about is really significant. Um, it's a, as the first time a code of welfare has been challenged in a New Zealand court successfully. Um, so I think it sends a really strong message to the government that there are individuals and organisations who are willing to stand up and to go to court to challenge legislation and processes that not only do not serve animals, but also are ultra virus or otherwise inconsistent with due process. Um, and in fact, in July this year, the New Zealand Animal Law Association and SAFE um, filed judicial review proceedings again against the New Zealand government, this time challenging the rodeo code of welfare, both on procedural and substantive grounds. So there is already further litigation in the pipeline. And yeah, I have no doubt that further legal proceedings will, will follow um, if this is increasingly seen as an effective way of um, protecting animals. Thank you, Bianca. And with that, we will end the session.